Board meeting of the Policy Committee of the University Interscholastic League is now in official session. For the record, it is approximately 3.30 p.m. on Sunday, October 18, 2020. In accordance with the waiver to certain provisions of the Texas Open Meetings Act issued by Governor Greg Abbott on March 16, 2020, and in the interest of avoiding large gatherings and promoting, promoting social distancing during this pandemic, this meeting is being held via teleconference and is live streaming. Council, you have been automatically muted at the meeting start. You can unmute yourself at the bottom left-hand part of the screen when needed. Council members who have called in, please enter star six to unmute or mute yourself. I am Aaron Hood, Superintendent of Robert Lee ISD. My fellow members of the Policy Committee are Joanne Bluda, Superintendent Houtsville ISD, Mark Henry, Superintendent Cypress Fairbanks ISD, Todd Morrison, Superintendent Honey Grove ISD, Steve Flores, Superintendent Round Rock ISD, Walter Jackson, Superintendent Brenham ISD, Keith Murphy, Superintendent Melissa ISD, and Marty Crawford, Superintendent of Tyler ISD. At this time, I certify that a quorum of the policy committee is present. Dr. Harrison, please introduce the UIL staff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Special thanks to Caroline Walls and Susan Doherty for making all things council happen. Um, this meeting would not be happening without them, I can assure you. Some of you heard from uh, Mr. Beasley, Daryl Beasley earlier, who is dealing with all of the various um, uh, concerns about schools following the rules and this year in particular, the COVID-19 risk mitigation guidelines. He's doing a great job of sorting through that. Um, we have uh, the three directors of our various competition departments, Dr. David Stevens, um, the Director of Academics, uh, Dr. Brad Kent, uh, State Director of Music, and Dr. Susan Elza, um, the Director of Athletics. Um, Arlo Flores is helping in the background, and I will turn it over at this time to Dr. Wright to make some opening remarks. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. I'll make it short because I have introduced all the other uh, directors in their, in their previous meetings today. I won't do that with Dr. Harrison because I am uh, his direct supervisor and we'll do that in my report tomorrow. So that will save us some time. I would tell you though, we wouldn't be where we are uh, with this uh, school year with our uh, activities if it weren't to, for the incredible work of Dr. Harrison. And those of you who've worked with him on this project know exactly what I'm talking about. So I'll leave it at that. And I will tell you as a committee how thankful we are uh, for your participation, not only in the meetings today, but throughout the year. Uh, your support for what we're doing and how we're doing it is uh, uh, very important to us. And uh, we want to share with you tomorrow uh, deep, detailed reports of what's happening and what we plan to do uh, for the remainder of the school year. As you know, all those plans are always on hold because we don't know what's next, but our plan is to move forward as much as possible and uh, I'll let each of those de uh, department directors talk to you about that and give you more detail tomorrow. So you should have all your questions answered. And if not, we'll take time during tomorrow's uh, general session to do that. Uh, I'm thankful for Chairman Hood and the questions that he's asked us uh, throughout uh, this fall and uh, helping us stay aligned to your purpose. And uh, I will turn this now over to him. Thank you, Dr. Brightup, and, and I know I speak on behalf of all the policy committee. We appreciate the work that you put in, the leadership that you provide, and everyone else that's on the policy side of UIL. You have no idea uh, what the question is going to be when you pick up the phone, and we appreciate you giving the answers that you give and, and, and actually picking up the phone when people call. So thank you on behalf of the policy committee. Before proceeding, I will give you instructions on voting. If you are connected on your computer, please click on participants at the bottom of your Zoom screen. A list of all participants will appear at the bottom. Um, at the bottom of the participant list, you should see options to click on yes or no. Council members who have called in, please enter star nine if you would like to vote yes. Going forward, please leave your vote up until UIL staff has recorded the vote and cleared the responses. Do any council members have any questions concerning how to vote? Moving to item B, adoption of meeting rules. Unless there is no objection from the committee members, this meeting will be conducted in accordance with the 2020-2021 Constitution and contest rules. Hearing no objections, it is so ordered. 
item C. Unless there is objection from the committee members, the agenda for the business meeting shall be as set out in the posted agenda unless otherwise announced by the chair. Hearing no objection, the agenda is officially adopted. Item D, approval of minutes. Members of the committee have previously been provided a copy of the minutes of the meeting of June 17, 2020. Are there any corrections or revisions to the, min to the minutes as printed? If not, I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes. I'll make that motion to approve. Okay, we have the motion. Do we have a second? I'll second that, Joanne. Okay. We have a motion and a second. At this time, would all members please vote? Motion passed unanimously. Okay. Moving on to item E, statement of committee purpose. The purpose of today's committee meeting is to consider proposals for changes in the UIL constitution and contest rules that have policy related aspects. We will report recommendations of this committee to the legislative council at today's session or tomorrow's session. Committee members, you have in your materials a list of motions which are often appropriate. This committee may take any action permitted by the UIL rules, including any of those you listed or any other motion a member wishes to make. This meeting is a business meeting of the committee and not a public hearing. Presentations may not be made by outside groups or individuals. The UIL director or a designated member of the UIL staff and, and council members not assigned to this committee shall be recognized to speak on any issue. Item F, old business. Pursuant to our agenda, the chair recognizes Jamie Harrison for presentation of old business. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll give a more thorough report uh, tomorrow, but would like to address sort of where we are um, in the uh, response to COVID-19 and in our competitive seasons. Um, from what we originally released, which included recognizing that certain interruptions uh, and obstacles would develop I believe we are at or better and likely better than where we would have predicted we would be um, at this time in October. Again, as I mentioned to the athletics committee, it has not been a perfect season and it is not going to be a perfect season. With the challenges being thrown at us, there's just no way to make it perfect. But we do have students with the opportunity to compete. We have communities with the opportunity to enjoy those competitions in schools who are reaping the benefits that come along with students participating in them. So we're really thankful for all of the school leaders across Texas, the superintendents, the athletic directors and band directors, the coaches, um, all of the sponsors for their hard work in a very challenging time uh, to make sure that uh, that, that we're able to continue to offer these competitive opportunities to students. Uh, Mr. Chair, there are no other reports under old business. Okay. Adam G, moving to new business. Um, pursuant to our agenda, the committee now proceeds to new business. Uh, Dr. Harrison, is there any new business to consider? We do have one proposal from the public um, related to eSports. Uh, as you know, this is a, a competition that UIL has been studying and watching closely for some time. Still feel like it's a competition that will end up with UIL sanctioning. Uh, the question is just timing. Uh, given all of the challenges we're facing to complete the seasons and the competitions that we currently sanction, it uh, does seem a little difficult to sanction a new one at this time. Uh, so the staff recommendation for this one would be to continue to monitor it closely. Do you need a motion to that effect? It'd be great. I'll make a motion that we continue to study uh, esports. We have a motion to con uh, to consider to monitor. Do we have a second? Second. second. Sorry. Good. Either one. At this time, would all members please vote? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Dr. Harrison. 
Our next um, proposal from the public is a request for us to alter the full-time uh, day student uh, rule. Um, they would like for a student to be able to, to attend an alternative school and in particular an online one and still be able uh, to compete at their home campus otherwise. We get proposals related to the full-time student rule and asking us to broaden opportunities for students to compete at a school that they don't actually attend regularly. As you guys know, being veteran members of this committee, our rules currently um, offer a lot of flexibility in that when a student is attending a school within an ISD. Um, this is one that anytime we've discussed it previously has been rejected, um, but we're happy to entertain any thoughts committee members may have. Is there any discussion from any committee member? Mr. Chairman, this is Mark Henry, Cypher ISD. I move that we reject the proposal. We have a motion to reject the proposal. Do I have a second? Second, Marty Crawford, Tyler ISD. We have a motion and a second to reject this proposal. At this time, would all members please vote? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Dr. Harrison, please continue. Um, the next proposal is a proposal to lift No Pass, No Play um, in light of the pandemic. As you guys know, No Pass, No Play is not a UIL rule. It's often con confused as such. It's actually a state law. We have worked very closely with the Commissioner of Education in uh, analyzing what's in statute and provided as much flexibility uh, related to No Pass, No Play for schools given the current context. Uh, but we do simply do not have the authority to uh, lift a state law. Um, so I, m my recommendation is no action is required on this one as you all does not have the authority to do that. Okay. You've heard the recommendation. Is there any comment? If not, we will take uh, no action. Moving on to item two, proposals referred to policy committee from the public hearing. So you all heard um, the proposal um, regarding the space teams competition. Um, we asked uh, Dr. Stevens and the Academics Committee um, to review this one to see how it would fit in our current STEM competitions. Dr. Stevens, do you have any kind of report from that conversation? Uh, we are voted to monitor this item. So with that, um, I would recommend no action by this committee as the Academics Committee will continue to monitor it and see how it will ultimately uh, if and how it will ultimately fit into um, our STEM-based competitions. Uh, you've heard the recommendation. Is there any discussion? You know, uh, Mr. Chairman, the only comment I would make, and I know very little about it, but it but it did seem a little intriguing to me. So I'll look forward to finding out more about it. Thank you. And I believe finally, we have um, a requirement uh, or a request to adjust the requirements for an overage student waiver. Um, so the current rule is that a student who is 19 on or before September 1st um, is not eligible for varsity athletics unless they are currently served by special education or 504 services. This request is a request to add students who are limited English proficient to that list. Um, the, the presenter made a great point that um, LEP is a, a special population, uh, much like other special populations. We have looked at revisions to this rule from other proposals uh, multiple times in the last decade. In each of those stops, um, whether we've conducted a survey and we have done that related to this rule or whether it's just been conversation amongst the committee members. What really um, the essential question on this particular proposal is, do you want more 19 year olds competing in varsity athletics? Um, the current, uh, this happened before I became a UIL employee, but it's my understanding that the current exception for students served in 504 or special education largely stems from uh, some litigation 
And that is an exception that schools by and large accept, but they have not been interested in opening for more 19 year olds while understanding that students who have limited English proficiency face particular challenges. It comes down to a competitive fairness issue and having uh, the, the physical and mental maturity that goes along with being older um, than the others against whom you're competing. Uh, so I'm happy to hear any comments from committee members. Do any com committee members have any comments? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, just, just to, to back up uh, what doc, uh, Dr. Harrison said, I think it, it does become a, a safety issue when we have more and more overage students. So uh, I'd, I'd recommend that we not, uh, not allow this at this time. I think that's wise, wise thinking. Is there any other discussion? If not, do I have a motion? That this mark, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I guess I'm gonna be on record making that motion also that uh, we, we reject that proposal at this time. Marty Crawford, second. We have a motion and a second at this time. Would all members please vote? Motion passed unanimously. Thank you. And does that move us to item four? Okay, yes, Dr. Harrison. So committee members, you will recall in June, um, we brought to you a resolution asking you to uh, grant additional authority to Dr. Brightup and UIL staff to help navigate through unforeseen issues that will come along unquestionably with COVID-19. At the time we posted that, we were in May so that you could discuss it in June. And we put an expiration date on it of September 1st, um, knowing a lot more now than we did in May. I think it's pretty clear that um, it would be very helpful and useful for that additional authority to be extended. Um, so this is the exact same resolution um, that we brought you previously. We simply changed the expiration date, as you see on the page on your screen now under number four, to August 1st. We chose August 1st because um, it is at least a reasonable possibility that some competitions may be delayed and we may have to push them back in, into July. Um, we didn't want to go much beyond August 1st right now uh, because you really start getting into the next school year once you get past August 1st. So if we get close to August 1st and need something else, we'll come back to you. Um, but we would ask that you grant um, this additional authority uh, to make exceptions and, and, and rules, frankly, short-term rules related to COVID-19 um, to Dr. Bridup uh, and UIL staff through August 1st. Okay. You've heard Dr. Harrison, and I will say this, Dr. Harrison, I think this has been instrumental in allowing us to be able to even have sports in the fall and be able to work through this. So I think this is a good thing, and I think y'all have used it very wisely, and y'all have done a good job um, and, and been very careful what you've done. So we appreciate that. Uh, any other discussion? If not, do I have a motion? Joanne Bluda, Hallettsville. I move to approve the res resolution as presented. We have I'll a second. motion. And we have a second, uh, Walter Jackson. At this time, will members of the policy committee please vote? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Do any committee members have any new business to present? It's it's not new business, but Mr. Chairman, just just a comment, and it was said earlier. I so appreciate the UIL staff uh, helping us navigate this difficult time. I, I I said the highlight of my year has been that first football game I went to, and although I couldn't see the smiles of of uh, children. I could see it in their eyes, the cheerleaders and the drill team and the band and the football team and, and the parents. And I, I just want y'all to know that uh, uh, UIL activities make a difference in the lives of our kids. So thank y'all for making it possible. 
Dr. Harrison, this is Joanne. I just wanted to say thank you also for your excellent guidance during these uncertain times. You really helped answer some questions for us in Hallettsville and uh, I just truly appreciate you being there and being available to talk us through um, and answer questions. So thank you. Dr. Harrison, Marty Crawford, Tyler, appreciate you dealing with the media uh, in regard to this and, and certainly your, uh, your advocacy within the agent uh, over to the agency as well. That's, that's uh, been well documented in uh, phone conversations and zoom calls with commissioner. So thank you for representing us over there as well. And also, Dr. Harrison, also Dr. Harrison, um, I don't know if you've been on the uh, Zoom calls with other regions, but you've attended Region 15 Zoom calls uh, when asked, and you've helped answer questions for superintendents and been available, and we do appreciate that too. So thank you for doing that. And I'll certainly echo the uh, sentiments of all of my colleagues to Dr. Harrison and to Brightup and to Dr. Elza as well. Um, probably the UIL sports, uh, what little we have is probably the only sense of normalcy we have in some of our communities. And so uh, a great big shout out to you and your staff at the UIL for the outstanding job that you continue to do on our behalf. So thank you very much. <clears throat> I'd like to thank the UIL for standing and having uh, the courage to move forward. There were a lot of people that were paralyzed by fear and I appreciate you allowing our um, parents to make decisions on behalf of our kids and let our coaches um, have an opportunity to show how seriously they take the profession and they've done a great job. I want to say this too, as we move forward, just a little thought, um, we need to protect all of us, our UIL sanctioned programs, um, sports, um, academics. And as we move forward, we're going to be faced with some tough financial decisions as superintendents. And um, I don't really know what that looks like. I think I have some ideas, but what I would say is, is that I think we should stand firm for, uh, for our programs that help our, build our kids um, and that do so successful um, in the next chapter of their life because of the foundation that we set in public schools and with our UIL. What a model of integrity. Couldn't be more proud to be a part of it. Mr. Chairman and committee members, Dr. Bright, if asked me to give you a report, I will give the full council a, a more thorough report tomorrow, but just quickly, to run down um, some of the ways that we utilized uh, the powers that come with the resolution that you passed in May and now are sending to full council tomorrow for the, for the rest of this school year. It, you know, it started off by giving um, your coaches some extra time with kids in the summer to make up for what they lost in the spring. Um, it, we offered some flexibility for students to get their pre-participation sports physicals at a time when it was really difficult and scary for some people to get into a doctor's office and, and have those completed. Um, we altered the eligibility rule that is a UIL rule um, for the first six weeks of school, recognizing that not all students were able to get the credits that they normally would get last year. And instead of having them start in a hole and start ineligible, we offered some flexibility on that. Um, that extra time that we gave to our kids and coaches during the summer has extended through the school year with the hour of strength and conditioning for out of season sports after school, allowing them some time to make up on skill work um, during the athletics period. We've worked very closely with the commissioner of education and he's been great to work with from a UI perspective um, to offer as much flexibility for no pass, no play, which is in statute. So there's not, a ton of flexibility to be offered, but where we could find some ways to let you guys make some more reasonable decisions as educational leaders to help your kids, we were able to work that in. Um, we've offered exceptions to the calendar week limitation, allowing schools some opportunities to make up games and get creative in terms of uh, scheduling of games so we can get as many games in as possible. Um, we've now, again, worked closely with the Commissioner of Education to offer an exception to the school week limitation. Um, for those sports who don't have a five-day rule. With football, it's a little harder. Having five days between football games is very important for safety, and the five-day rule has not gone away. It is still in effect, but having that flexibility with the school week limitation and having the exception offered in the law apply, I think it's going to be really helpful to district executive committees as they get in further into district schedules and have schools who aren't able to compete um, here and there. The issue of fan capacity continues to be a question that we're asked 
regularly. We are currently at a statewide maximum of 50%. It is very important for everyone watching to understand that each school determines 50% of that capacity. We do not have a prescription for how you determine that. You don't have to do it specifically by the number of seats. You may have areas in a football field, for example, where you have fans stand and that counts as capacity. So you determine what 50% capacity is. Um, as we've entered conversations, we, we, do, we have some superintendents and some schools in certain areas who say, please don't raise that right now. We're doing everything we can to make this work now. We do have some who are saying it's time for us to go higher because they've seen in some spaces, um, retail and restaurants in particular, that have been raised to 75%, they wanna see us raised to 75%. The really important thing to note about that is the number we put in front of the percentage sign um, only does so much. The governor's order still requires in large public gatherings that you have the six feet of spacing when at all possible. And so no matter what number you put on it, you, you really, you can only accomplish so many people and still maintain that kind of spacing. Um, so we're going to continue to keep an eye on that and monitor the public health context statewide. And if there's an opportunity for us to offer something different, we're certainly willing to do that. Right now, when you consider the spacing, that's really more important than the percentage. And so getting much higher than where we are isn't going to help you get any more people in to a facility if you're not able to keep them spaced out. So again, uh, as I've said multiple times today, our seasons have not been perfect. There are some, some real challenges that we have to find solutions for. But one COVID-related postponement does not necessarily equal a different COVID-related postponement. A postponement in week nine of a 16 district is not the same as a postponement in week two of a 10 team district. It's not the same in volleyball that it is in football because you have so many other opportunities to make those games up in volleyball. As we start looking at competitive marching band season, as we start looking at student Congress, which will happen during this fall semester, if you're going to say if a school has qualified but it's not able to compete for COVID-19 reasons, we're going to hold the entire state until that school can participate. You have to understand that in that delay, there will likely be other schools who could compete on the original date who now have some COVID-19 related reason that won't allow them to compete on the rescheduled date. So as we go through these conversations, I realize that folks in particular in the media wanna see some hard and fast one size fits all rules when it comes to COVID-19 cancellations. They're just not the same. If 60% of your kids are out, that is one instance. If your best player is out and is the only one quarantined, well, that's not the same thing. And so the people who are most familiar with all of the facts that go along with each individual case are the folks in the, at the local level, at the local district executive committee. UIL staff has been readily available and heavily involved in helping offer guidance as best we can to sort through some of those individual case by case circumstances. And then as a safety net, if there is a situation where a local district executive committee makes a decision, that negatively impacts the school and that school believes that that is an unfair and irrational decision, we do have the appeals process available with the state executive committee. So none of that is perfect, but it is working very, very well. In every game that you get to go to, you should count as a blessing because we just don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow or next week. So we're really happy to keep moving forward as we progress towards postseason competition in athletics, as we progress towards our first academic competitions and we're already talking very heavily about competitive marching band. So we're happy to have those conversations because that means we're competing. But please know um, that until we have all the facts of a situation, de developing a solution is really, really difficult when you're working on hypotheticals. Are there any questions from any committee members about any of our COVID-19 response or plans moving forward? I, I, I do have a couple of comments, Dr. Harrison. Um, on some of the things that you said, <clears throat> I would appreciate just because in our area, there's been a lot of misconception about the email y'all sent out about the, the limit on the games per week and, and football in particular. Do you think it's a possibility y'all could uh, clarify that with another email by letting them know that football is still five days um, between games so that everybody understands that? Same page. 
Yes, we can absolutely do that. Okay. And and then the when you're talking about using the um, uh, the resolution and visitors and, and allowing visitors in, I visited with the athletic committee today and I, and I brought up um, a concern that some of the people out here have about some schools not allowing uh, visitors, uh, fans into the games. And I did get on the phone in between and talk to those superintendents and their main concern, the DEC does, does handle the district um, uh, decisions on that, but what about non-district games? And I know they're always going to have the, the option of not to go play that. But that may be, if, if, if we get into that situation and it continues to be a problem, uh, might can be addressed through the resolution and might, might not. I don't know. But uh, not allowing visitors in and, and putting home fans on both sides of a game and a basketball game uh, is giving some heartburn to some superintendents, and, and that could be a problem. So I would like some feedback from the committee members. I asked for the same from the athletics committee members. So to bring everybody up to speed, um, the question is who trumps who? So we have some school districts. It, it, this is limited, but when it happens, it's an issue. Who have said, we're going to allow our home fans into our games. We are not going to allow your road fans into our games. And so local district executive committees meet and they come to some agreement on that. But then there are instances where a school board weighs in and says, these are our facilities. We are not going to let any out of towners in, home fans only. So one option to consider is for us through the use of the resolution is to send clarification that, a that unless the district executive committee votes otherwise, or unless the two schools involved in the game uh, mutually agree otherwise. You can, as a local school district, say you are not allowing fans in, but if you are going to allow any fans in, you have to also allow the visiting fans in in whatever capacity that is determined by the district executive committee. We heard a number of different ways that district executive committees are, uh, are addressing that. And, you know, some are this percentage of the tickets need to go to the vis visitors. Others took the smallest facility in their district, applied 50% and said, okay, visitors get half of that at all facilities, even if they're larger. So I think we can let district executive committees figure those, de those details out. Um, but how would the committee members feel about us using the resolution in that way, clarifying it's either no fans or you're going to have to let road fans in as well? Well, well, Johnny, I think that's good. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Excuse me. No, I think that's wise. At the end of the day, we've got seniors from both communities that are trying to compete, and parents deserve an opportunity to watch their kids because these opportunities only come, you know, once in a lifetime. And I, I it, it kind of, um, I can't believe that we would have some districts that would operate that way. I'm not going to judge, but I, Jamie, anything we could do and Aaron to facilitate. Uh, visitors be able to come to ball games. I sure wish we would find a way to do that. Well, I, I, I agree. You know, we're lucky enough to be in a district and in an area where that's not a problem for Robert Lee ISD, but it, it is a problem for others. And, you know, if it's unsafe to have visitor fans in a gym, I just have an opinion it's probably unsafe to have home fans in a gym for the visiting team who's entering that gym. So if you can't have fans, that's understandable if you think that and you want to have a game, but if you are going to have fans, then 50% capacity, uh, let them come in and, and then let them play the game. That's just my opinion. And I think using that resolution in that term, because I think that's what is the problem is it's, it, this is definitely COVID related. I don't, I've never heard of this outside of uh, the, till COVID happened. So I would be in favor of using the resolution for that too. I, I agree. Just to to, to add a, another vote, uh, as a as a father and now a grandfather, um, if we're going to open the stadiums and the gymnasiums, uh, visitors uh, or or parents and grandparents, I understand you have to limit the number. But you know, even even what we do, where we mostly play each other here in Cy Fair, we uh, we limit the number, but we make sure that the parents have an opportunity if we're going to have fans to see their children participate. And as Keith said, it literally is. It's it's once in a lifetime. So parents should definitely have the ability to 
watch their children. Jamie, this is Joanne. I agree as well. Uh, we've actually had in-person learning since August 20th and everything's been working fine. We've worked it out with our visiting teams and it just seems like there's a mutual respect and the parents most of all just truly appreciate having that opportunity. So I'm in agreement. Well, rep representing uh, Region 36A and Walter, Walter's in here too. Uh, could we have a resolution to not let the North Shore or Katy football team in our stadiums? Would that be a possibility? <laughs> well, that feedback, I think that that's very helpful to us. Okay. Any other committee member have any other uh, new business they would like to present? Okay, if not, moving to I. Are there any announcements prior to the conclusion of this meeting? Dr. Braddock, anything? Uh, Mr. Chair, very efficient work. Um, we got through a lot of information very quickly. Uh, if you have any questions overnight that you wanna uh, have us uh, speak about tomorrow, please don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, we're gonna give extensive reports from each of our departments tomorrow. And uh, hopefully we won't uh, take too long, too much of your time, but. If you have something of concern uh, along the lines that uh, uh, Chairman Hood just mentioned a moment ago, don't hesitate to send those to us and we'll make sure to address those tomorrow. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bradup. And um, I would like to thank uh, Mark Henry. He's agreed tomorrow to present the policy committee information to the uh, Legislative Council. I will be, um, I thought I was going to be not, unable to attend. I'm going to try to attend on my cell phone. I've got to head to Dallas. Uh, yeah, I've got uh, back surgery I've, I've got to go under. So I will not be at the policy committee meeting, but I'm sure Dr. Henry will do a good job and get a couple of jab, jabs in on Dr. Poole for me, uh, Dr. Henry. <laughs> well, if not, um, if there's no other announcements, I appreciate everybody. I, I appreciate the policy committee and uh, working with this and, and being ready to go for the meetings and. Uh, getting through this uh, quickly but efficiently and um, if not this meeting is adjourned thank you to all of you